uh, the Stewarts <clears throat> are faithful missionaries to Taiwan. They've uh, been serving the Lord faithfully. I'm hoping at some point uh, they'll be able to talk to you a little bit about language. Uh, we barely got an opportunity to talk about that. Um, there's a lot of nuance and the language they learn that is so different from what we have in American English. And uh, it's really cool to see, especially if there's a way for them to show you texting, how they text. And what is exactly, you, I'm not going to go into it, you just, you, you get to show them. But anyway, I've, I've, I want to let everybody know, I've told them that we normally get done at uh, 11.45. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a lie. Uh, yeah, central time, uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, so uh, we are, if you're visiting fellowship, I um, want to say welcome to you before Brother Stewart comes. Just to let you know a little bit about the church, just so you can understand the flavor of who we are and why we do what we do. Uh, we often describe fellowship under the banner of 1 John 1, 3. And in that, that talks about a, a, um, it talks about a, a communion that we have together, a fellowship that we have together based on Christ. And so what we tell people is that we come here, first of all, and top priority is to fellowship with God. So what's going to happen next is we open our Bibles. Uh, we are going to hear from God's Word. And fellowshipping with God really is the heartbeat of being surrendered to what the Word of God says. And worshiping him where we're surrendered to his sovereignty, his majesty, and uh, we, again, are submissive to him uh, through his word. We're also a place that uh, believes in fellowship with believers. We believe that the church was designed as called out ones, believers, who come together to worship God. And in the nature of that fellowship with believers, uh, we do everything from exhortation to admonishment to encouragement. In other words, we are the body of Christ loving each other. And then we invite the lost into that fellowship through the gospel. So our belief is that if we lift up Jesus, point people to Christ, he will draw people to himself. And it's our hope that you'll experience the love of Christ here and at least get a chance to uh, know who the Lord is and minister one to another. And in that vein, it's a blessing to have missionaries who've been building upon the Word of God in places that we are not and in places around the world that need the gospel. And I often am a little jealous of the fact that when you take someone who's been on the field, on the foreign field, and bring them back to a supporting church, they're often identified as missionaries, and yet I will just underscore that we are missionaries as well. We're missionaries right here where God has placed us, and the very nature of what they're doing in partnership with fellowship is what we're doing here, trying to lift up Christ and stand firmly on the Word of God. So, Brother Stewart, thanks for coming. Thank you. You know, I didn't really realize in Sunday school how many people had not met us yet. And so I'm going to just take a couple minutes and kind of introduce our family to you. And uh, this is really a snapshot of our lives. If you want, you can start turning to the book of Psalms, Psalm 23. Uh, but I'm just going to say a couple things before I introduce ourselves. One is like we have a table out there. It's on my right as you go out the back. Um, but we have prayer cards on it, and uh, if you would like one, um, we would ask you to take one or two or five or whatever. I have more in the car, so if we run out, it's fine. Um, so many people tell me, well, I'll, I'll just take one because I want to save you money. You don't save me any money by not taking them. There's a whole other box back in Indiana after the one in the car is gone. And when we get back next furlough, if there is a next furlough, then we'll burn that box and start all over again because we can't give you the old ones because the kids have grown up. Uh, Rachel and I get younger, the kids get older, and so please take them um, and pray for us. You can put them lots of places. You can put them on your fridge. You can put them in your Bible. You can put them in a basket. You can put them in front of a, of a mouse hole, whatever, but just put them somewhere and pray for us if you would. So if you would note that, and then if you don't currently get our update emails, uh, there's a sign-up sheet uh, on the back there uh, if you would like to sign your name and put your email down. And um, I'll just say, if, if you get a month out and you don't get an email from us, then maybe uh, shoot us an email. 
we might have maybe not read your writing right or something and written in the wrong email. So if, if you don't get one in a month or two, just email us and say, hey, can you put our, our name and address in there and we'll, we'll happily do that. So we're not trying to exclude anybody, but you can understand sometimes it's hard to read people's writings, right? You know, we're not all, uh, we don't all have perfect handwriting. I know I don't. People struggle to read mine. And my, my daughter gives me a hard time when she's trying to take notes and I'm actually sitting beside her. She's like, dad, I can't read. It's like, Sorry, I'm not taking them for you. <laughs> so I'm taking them for me. So uh, anyway, if you would do that, we would love to let you know what God's doing there. And I um, just want to say it's really a blessing to be with you all. And uh, we, it's been a long time, several years since we've been, I would say here, but it's not here. It was there, wherever there was. I don't even know it that way. So uh, it's good to be in this building with you, but um, it's been a long time and we've enjoyed the day and last night and the kids have really enjoyed being with other kids their age and really fellowshipping. Sometimes that doesn't always happen for them. So I just want to say a thank you from me as a dad to all of you who just have uh, kids that you've, grown, uh, you've raised to serve the Lord and love the Lord and uh, just to welcome people in, not just as adults, but as kids as well. So just thank you to you all as a church. And uh, we just want to uh, say that we wouldn't have made it through the last term were it not for your prayers. And so thank you for your faithful prayers for us. We know that God is the one that works and not us. And so we just, uh, as Pastor Phil, I guess, said, we're nothing. But, but God can do great things through little servants. And so we just uh, thank you for your prayers. A little snapshot about us, how we got here. I grew up in Indiana, uh, farm boy. Rachel grew up in Wyoming. And... Um, we both went to BJ, but never met there. And then I went to China in 06. She came in 07. We met there, dated, and came back to the States, got married. We're back a year and a half. And then um, there was an interim period, about four years. I came back, was associate pastor at our sending church, the church I grew up in from 12 on in Indiana. And then uh, during that time, I also did a, a master's program and then uh, also did... Um, uh, deputation, and then from there we went to, back to China for a year. Rachel got sick. The doctors said we had to come back to the States and couldn't stay there. And I said, we've spent too much time learning the language and doing deputation. Can't we try Taiwan? And because at least it's a similar language. I say similar. I mean, to you, it's Mandarin Chinese. To us, it's the difference between American English and British English. And if you haven't talked to British people or they're not your good friends, I have some, then you think, oh, that's nothing. No, it's, it's a big deal. You walk around and they say, hey, that's the pavement. You say, I call it sidewalk. And they say, hey, that, can you take that and put it in the boot? I'm like, what boot are you talking about? They mean the boot of the car, the trunk. Or, oh, can you toss that in the lorry? What's the lorry? It's a truck. I mean, so it's big differences, and there's big differences when we went to Taiwan. They were instead of, in fact, just as we were leaving, the taxi that was taking us to the airport, he said, oh, you're from China, aren't you? I was like, how'd you know? I've been here seven years. How would you know? And he said, oh, you said, turn right in a different way than normal. I was like, oh, yeah, I did, didn't I? I remember that now. Because in, in China, you'd say Yoguan, and in, in Taiwan, you'd say Yochuan. And it's the same thing. It just, it just, they don't say that there. And so anyhow... We moved there, um, and we got connected in the church, and in fact, one lady was asking us, um, last time you were here, you didn't quite know what God wanted you to do, if you were going to go out and plant a church, or what was next, and I said, yeah, we'd been, when we came back last, we'd been there for about a year and a half, and we didn't know if we were going to go out and plant a new church, or stay with the church where we're at, because we, we uh, wanted to go out, we've wanted to go out for seven years, but the churches needed us, our co-workers weren't there for a long period of time, and they were FA for a period of time, so we've continued to be the pastor there. And God just led us year by year to keep staying. And so uh, tonight you'll see more on the DVD, but that's just kind of a really fast uh, maybe introduction to my family. So if you want to know more, you can. You probably all met Anna. She said she went up and down each aisle, and then she said, I talked to everybody, so I came back and talked, found you, Dad. And so you probably met her. The kids have played with Nate. And uh, so anyway... Uh, you can get to know us more afterwards. I would like to take you to Psalm 23 now this morning. Um, maybe you think, boy, he's going to take uh, a whole morning message just to speak on Psalm 23, and I'm not. I'm going to take a whole morning message to speak on Tom, Psalm 23, 6. Uh, when I went to study this text out for myself, 
I found much more there than I could get into 12 sermons. And so uh, you're getting one section. And so I kind of feel sorry for you. I mean, my kids and my wife, they go with me. And so they kind of hear the sermons in order and they can kind of follow through. You guys don't get that. You just have to take what comes to you in a snapshot form. I'll try and kind of give you a running start in verses 1 to 5. And then uh, we'll pick up here in verse 6. But Maybe you could do something Taiwanese with me. In fact, it's very Asian. If you could just all read the text aloud with me, and then we will pray, and then we'll look into it. Let's read it together. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, I think we all know uh, from verse 1 that as the Lord is our shepherd, if he's the one taking care of us, we shall not. And that word want means to lack any good thing. And so that's what Psalm 34 says, that we will not lack any good thing. There might be things that we don't have, but there's nothing good that we need that we lack since God is our shepherd. And maybe to throw out as just an introduction to this, I know I've heard since I was a boy Uh, from different people that, you know, this is written by David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. And, you know, he's sitting out with his sheep as a young teenage boy, kicking his heels in the brook, playing his harp and making up psalms of praise to God. And they all from his teenage years became inscripturated. And and we now have them in the book of Psalms. And as I've learned and grown over the last several years, as I've studied off and on, dipped into the book of Psalms for different sermons, I found that as I preach through the the Davidic Psalms, really I can't find for sure any of them that came from his teenage years. Many of them came from much later in his life, his 30s, his 40s. I mean, you can prove some of them very specifically because either the Psalm itself tells you uh, an event in David's life when it happened and when he wrote it. And so you know for a fact how old he is. Um, Some of them like this one don't, but I still do not believe that it was written when he was very young. I think it was written when he was older. I think this is not a statement of youth and and just the impetuousness of youth that says, I know that I'm going to be fine and this is my statement of faith that will lead me through life. I think that this is a statement of David as an older man looking back and saying, this has always been true. And, And many, even as they look at the Psalms, we know... Uh, Psalm, I'm going to have to look back now really quick. Psalm 3 and 13, they think 3, 13 and 23 go together. We know Psalm 3. Uh, the, the postscript tells us that Absalom, he wrote this when he fled from Absalom and his son. Many think that Psalm 3 was written the night as he is running away. Psalm 13 is written the next morning. And then Psalm 23, as he's talking about having a prepared table in the presence of his enemies is written the next day when he meets Barzillai the Gileadite and they have all sorts of food for him. So that would give you an approximate date he's in his 50s if that's true. It might not be. It might be that he's much older than this and looking back and saying, you know what? I remember times when I was in the wilderness fleeing from Saul, when I was in the Philistine city and I would forsaken my God and had lost faith that I was going to stay alive and be king and I left God provided for me then when God, when I was fleeing from Absalom, my son, God provided for me then and and he's provided for me every day of my life and I've never lacked. And so I think this is a statement of of David, of testimony, not of what he's going to do, but what God has already done for him. And that kind of sets the rest of it in its place for us just a little bit. He says that God makes us to lie down because sometimes sheep are stubborn And if you are an American, you might be uh, one of those ones that thinks you have to work hard and you never get to rest and you have to bring everything about for yourself, whether it's financial success or spiritual success. And if you work hard enough and drive hard enough that you can make it happen. And when the shepherd makes his sheep lie down, sometimes it's like making a dog learn to sit. You have to push them down so they'll lay and they start to get back up and you put them down again and you say stay and you make them lie down 
and rest because the good shepherd knows they need rest. And it's in green pastures where they have enough to eat. And the still waters, which he has stilled with his own body or his own preparation, as sheep are so weak and so defenseless, so helpless, that even too much water will kill them because if their wool gets soaked, they get pulled down and they drown. There's a famous uh, Chinese story about a, a man who had a donkey that liked to lie down under his load of salt so that when he stood up, it was much lighter. And so the farmer got mad and he said, all right, I'm going to load him up with a bunch of sponges and uh, he, when he tried to stand up after sitting down under that load, he couldn't because the weight was too heavy. That's what happens to the sheep. And so they're afraid of raging waters or even rippling brooks like we like to sing about. They're afraid of those because they can't tell how deep it is. They're so nearsighted, they can't see how deep the water is. So the shepherd has to either use his body to slow down the water so it's still or else he builds a small dam so that he can give them still waters that they're not afraid to drink. And he then restores our soul because Jesus says, I mean, it's said of him in Isaiah, but then he says it again of himself in Matthew, I think it's 12, where he says a smoking reed he will not um, quench and a broken reed he will not throw away. Well, he doesn't throw his servants away. He restores them when sometimes it'd be easier to throw us away and start all over again. I mean, have you ever heard that saying, well, it'd be easier to throw this away, start over new than to fix the old one. God's not like that. He restores us. And what to me is really beautiful, He restores us and He leads us in the paths of righteousness. Even though we've strayed away, now He leads us back in these paths of righteousness. There's a lot in there. Uh, I can't exegete for you right now, but it's for His namesake. So you need never say, He's going to chuck me because I have sinned so much, so bad, so long. He's done with me. His name, if, if you're His child, if you're a Christian, if you bear His name, if it's if it's your family name now, his name is in you, his reputation is at stake, and he will do this for his name's sake. And so you need not fear that he's done with you. He will use you. And so we come to the famous verse, and we know that if we walk through the valley of shadow of death, and this is why I say I think this is David as an old man. I mean, us, when we're young, we think, I can take anything in the world, right? And then we get old and say, I can't do anything, apart from Christ, if we're Christians. And I think David is saying, you know what, I've been through a lot. I've been around the stink of death since I fought Goliath, even since I fought the lion and the bear. I've been in many battles. I have been in danger from my own family. And I will not fear. And if you want to know a very interesting thing exegetically for, for this text, those words, I will not fear, are the very center of this text in Hebrew. 26 words from the beginning, 26 words from the end, uh, you find the phrase right in the middle, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. So I'm sorry, I said that wrong. For thou art with me are the, is the middle. He's not going to fear, not because he's strong, not because he's brave, but because God is with him. And so then he says his rod and staff, for whether it is for protection like the rod or whether it is for punishment, as also the rod was used that's a comfort to David because he's a mature believer now. He's the one that later says, let the righteous smite me. It will be like a fine oil to my head. I, my head. Let my head not refuse it. And he is going to accept God's or other righteous men's rebukes and corrections. He is not a proud king. He is willing to be taught and is teachable. And so now we come to verse 5 and 6. We're going to more be in, in verse 6 later. But he says, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know, this is where I come to our text this morning. God's prepared provisions, or you could say God's prepared path. Because our God is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, Genesis twenty-two fourteen, 14. And so Jesus is going to pick up on this idea, this theme of not just verse 1, also verse 5 and 6, where he says God can provide all your needs. He can provide what you need to eat, what you need to wear, what you need to drink. So don't worry about that. That's what the Gentiles worry about. And so, God's prepared provisions or His prepared path, whichever you'd like to write down. But He prepares. And He prepares when we're behind enemy lines. Because when you're a sheep, you're always behind enemy lines. Everything and everyone is your enemy when you're a sheep. Birds, bugs, weeds, snakes, bears, lions, thieves, rocks, water. To If you're a sheep, all of them are dangerous to you. They're all potentially deadly. You're constantly in the shadow of death, even if you're in the meadow. And that's where we live. And we think maybe in America we're more safe than the Christians in Ukraine or in China, but we're not. We are in danger all the time. We have 
Paul listing out for us our enemies. And they're much more than just flesh and blood, right? That's what he says. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against enemies, principalities, powers. Really great rulers that are much more powerful than us. That's why we have to stand in God's strength, not our own. And so we, we find here that God prepares a table. If you were going to go back to Genesis 24, you would find that God prepares a wife for Isaac. We find that God has been preparing longer than Isaac ever knew. Because right at the end of 22, right after Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, he mentions Rebecca was born. He's been preparing a long time. God always prepares much in advance. You look at the story of Joseph and if you look from Genesis, it looks like God just working chronologically. But you look from Psalm 105 and you see that he planned a long time ahead for the famine. So before the famine, he sends a man, Joseph. God is a prepared God. He is constantly providing and he's providing long before we ever have need. That's what happened with Esther. Twelve years before he used her in the palace, he was preparing her, putting her into place. And before that, he was preparing her as a young woman to be obedient to Mordecai. And so David, as he looks back, he realizes he's never lacked one good thing that he thought he needed. Sometimes he thought he needed safety and he lacked it or he lacked water. Or he lacked a wife, friends, sons. But in the end, he said, I've never lacked and I never will. God has always provided. He's always been prepared. And so he tells us, you know what? You might not see the green pastures. You might not feel the still waters, but you can still trust and know that God is a prepared God. He will prepare you a table, even if it's in the presence of your enemies. And so maybe a quick side note as we start into this verse. We need to note, I think, a, an exegetical point as we look at this. Some people think that in verses 5 to 6, David, uh, David suddenly switches his metaphors. And instead of speaking of a shepherd and sheep, now you're speaking of a, of a host and host. Uh, what's the word? Host and not hostess. Guest. Thank you. Here we go. Um, anyway... Um, but I don't think so. I mean, we see the Father's house and we dwell there forever. We see the Father's table and we eat there. But I don't think David abandoned the metaphor of the shepherd and sheep in the last few verses. We see him using oil. And we um, look at the Israeli shepherd and they use the oil to do many things. To anoint the head of the sheep. To keep them safe. And interestingly enough, it was to keep snakes away. Um, from the head because sheep are so stupid. You know, most animals are smart enough. They see the snake and they turn around and run. Well, sheep are so stupid. They say, they see the snake and say, huh, what's that cute little critter? They're smaller than me. And so they get bit on the nose instead of the heel. And so the shepherd put the oil on the head to keep the snake away. Well, how does that keep the snake away? Well, he's a prepared shepherd. He carries, he carries enough oil up there that he, as he prepares the table, he is going around the meadow and he finds all the snake holes and he circles them with oil. And an interesting thing I didn't know about snakes is that snakes hate the feel of oil on their skin. And so then as they crawl out of their hole, they get it on their skin. They think, oh, that stinks. It's with me all the time. I can't get away from the smell. And they go up to the sheep and they smell it on the head. And they think, ugh, that's disgusting. Get me out of here. So the snake doesn't bite the sheep. And so the shepherd is a prepared shepherd. And beyond that, uh, he says, my cup runneth over. That has some... Um, Tie backs to what the Israeli shepherd, if it was his own sheep, if he was the good shepherd, as we would find from John 10, he fills the sheep's trough, it's actually a cup, till it runs over to show that he gives more than enough. Instead of saying like the bad shepherd, this, just the hireling saying, you've had a drink, get out of here. I don't want to haul water for two hours. I only want to haul water for one hour. So you all get a little drink, not enough to drink. I will not give you more than necessary to keep you alive. And so you have that. And besides that, um, I'm going to explain this later, but he has these two, I'm going to call them sheepdogs, goodness and mercy that pursue us, and I'll explain that as well later, all the days of our life. And the Israeli shepherds, some of them actually did use dogs, if we can use Job 30, when he says, I would have disdained to set these men with the dogs of my flock. And sometimes people have taken that to mean like the really lowly shepherds. But I think we can take it very literally and say there were sheepdogs that helped these shepherds. So I just want to note that this shepherd cares for us. He's prepared. And so David, as he looks through this psalm, he knows he's loved by the Father's heart. He's led by the Father's hand and he's welcome in the Father's house. And so we have a prepared path. That's verses 3 and 4. A prepared table. Verse 5 we'll look at now in more detail. And then a prepared home. Verse 6. And so he says, truly... 
Only the Lord can prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. And so uh, we look at this God that's so great that can make sure we don't lack. And we find that even in the presence of our enemies, he can still provide for us. How can he do that? Well, he already explained it in, in Exodus, right? He says, I am that I am. And, and we wouldn't name someone that, right? If we were going to give someone a sentence as a name, we give them a complete sentence, not a, an incomplete sentence. He just says, I am. Whatever you are, whatever you need, I, I am. Wherever you're at, if you are in the dark, I'm the light. If you're outside, I'm the door. If you need food, I'm the bread of life. If you need water, I give living water. If you need care, I'm the good shepherd. If you need life, I'm the resurrection and the life. If you need guidance, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If you need strength, I'm the vine. And so Jesus is the I am. And so God has given Moses his name from the very beginning from a bush that did what? Didn't burn up. Now I know there's lots of bushes uh, in the world and all of them, if they burn, they burn very fast. There's not much to them. They crackle, they burn, they're gone. And yet this burn, this bush did not burn up because God is the inexhaustible God who can keep everything running as long as he wants it to. He's the one that has so many tons of gas burn up in the sun every single day. And yet it's still up there giving us light, giving us heat. He has no limits to himself. So from the beginning, we need to understand that this prepared God is able to give you food no matter where you are, to take care of you no matter where you are. To meet your needs uh, physically and spiritually, emotionally, mentally, no matter where you are, even in the presence of your enemies. And so you have this prepared table. And to maybe give you kind of an illustration and kind of help you think about this, uh, hopefully uh, very well and very deeply. You know, C.S. Lewis tells a story about a, a prepared table from which all these people who were hungry came and they were afraid to eat because they looked at the table and they saw a few people that were unconscious and they said, you know what, they ate from here and it's because of this food that they're unconscious. But down through history, hundreds, perhaps thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people have been poisoned by their food and died because of their food, sometimes from, from accidents. You know, your food is bad. And you ate it, and you're so sick, you die. That happens with food poisoning. But many on purpose, because someone wanted to kill them. And I could give different historical uh, um, incidents, but I'm going to give one. Nehemiah. That his whole job is to taste food before the king eats it, so that if it was poisoned, Nehemiah died, not the king. And so some incredibly rich rulers could not come home and eat in peace. And they would come home and they could be in danger even in the presence of their family because their family wanted to kill them so they could be king or they could be rulers or they didn't like how someone did something. And if you study out the book of Esther and kind of fit it in its historical context or you read more about Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar, all the poisoning that went on to the different kings till you get down to Belteshazzar. It's really amazing. These great kings, they could go out to battle, have a great war, be perfectly safe, surrounded by their army, surrounded by war, and they get home and they eat a meal and they're dead. And yet God says, I don't have those problems. I can protect you in the presence of your enemies. I can protect you and feed you in the presence of your enemies. No matter where you are, I can take care of you. I can give you what you need. In fact, in the kids' devotions, we just read about the king of Assyria. And remember, the death angel comes, kills 185,000 soldiers. And so he goes home. Where does he die? In the house of his God. His God was so weak, it couldn't protect him while he was worshiping. And his two sons were the ones that killed him. And so God says, you know, I'm very different than that. I can protect you. I can provide for you in the presence of your enemies. And he tells Abraham, I'm your shield. I'm your exceeding great reward. Psalm 3, verse 3, David talking about Solomon when he's fleeing, or not talking about Absalom, but when he's fleeing from Absalom, God says, I'm your shield on all sides. That's the kind of shield you need when you don't know which direction attack will come from. He can protect us in good times. That's verses 2 and 3. He can protect us in bad times and provide for us in bad times. Verse 4, he can protect us and provide for us whether we need food, drink, or clothing. So what kind of enemies do we have near this table? That would be a good question to ask. Uh, we've already passed through the valley of the shadow of death, right? That's verse 3, or verse 4 rather. So if we're done with all the problems, why would there be enemies now? Well, you're a sheep. There's enemies all around you. You never get out of enemy territory until you get to heaven, until you get to the Father's house. And so on top of the mountain, as they had to pass through that valley of the shadow of death just to get to the mountain peak where the 
the grass was better, more nutritious. I don't know if there's any farmers here, but I know uh, in Indiana we have very good grounds. We have hay that's really good. But even in Indiana, we have a lot of farmers, milk farmers in particular, that will buy hay from where? Idaho. Because hay grown up high has more nutrients than hay grown down low where we are. And so they'll ship it in for four times the price of what we would, they could get it for in Indiana because it'll make better milk production. And so I'm just saying the shepherd gets them through all these troubles and prepares this table for them to eat at because it's more nutritious for the sheep. And yet even up there, they're in much danger. What do they have to be in aware of up there? Well, lions, bears, hyenas, and jackals. I didn't know until I studied this that hyenas and jackals are two different kinds of things. They, they are actually. Uh, wolves, poisonous snakes, eagles, which can sweep down and pick up a, a young lamb. Poisonous weeds, bugs, flies, and they're all around the mountain meadow, not to mention the cliffs, rocks, and holes. I mean, this isn't a picnic in the park. This is a picnic in the jungle. The the sheep could be eating lunch and then become lunch, right? And so, what's the shepherd have to do to the table to prepare it or to the table land to prepare it? Well, he has to walk around. I already said he goes around uh, the meadow and finds all the snake holes and circles them with oil. But he does more than that. He uses his staff like a hoe and he digs up all the poisonous plants, lays them on a rock, lets them, them dry out and wither so they can't produce more. He goes around, he puts up some small barricades in places where he thinks the, the sheep might fall off the cliff. He goes and he finds the places where the jackals and the wolves most often hide so he can be alert in those areas. And so he he prepares the table. He makes it a safe place for the sheep to eat, to sleep, and to live because he's the good shepherd. But what did he not do? He didn't do something that you and I both are all wish that he would do. He didn't get rid of the enemies. I mean, this shepherd did not take up a high-powered rifle and sit there and shoot every snake he could see, shoot every wolf he could see, shoot every bear or lion or whatever he could see and say, all right, it's good, it's safe, bring them up here and I'm going to leave them for a few weeks, they'll be fine. He didn't do that. He doesn't get rid of the enemies. He minimizes their damage. Instead of isolating the sheep, he insulates them. And so he someday will get rid of all the enemies. We, We know that Jesus says that someday some of the unsaved will become his sheep. That's John ten sixteen. But he'll get rid of all the enemies, those that persecute, those that hurt his children. Someday they will be gotten rid of. Revelation twenty fourteen tells us that death and hell will someday go to the lake of fire. The devil will someday be thrown in the lake of fire. That's Revelation twenty ten. Someday he'll get rid of all of them. But right now, God wants to keep us and provide for us in the midst of our enemies. We need to understand that's what pastor was saying. We're all missionaries. We go out into a world that is not Christian every single day. And maybe, maybe some of the changes in our society are, are helpful for us as Christians. It makes us stand up and draw some lines and draw some conclusions and to stand up and say, I don't believe that's right. And to be a testimony and to understand that we're not in utopia. We're not in heaven yet. America's not it. We have a much better place coming. And so God keeps us in the midst of our enemies. He wants us, because he wants us to depend on him, not our safe environment. I mean, I remember as a young kid hearing that, oh, if kids had a better environment, they'd grow up to be better. Well, that's a bunch of hogwash. That's not true. I've seen a lot of kids come up in great families and they are horrible hoodlums, if I can say it. Because they have not been changed by Christ. God doesn't want us to depend on a safe environment. He wants us to depend on Him. He doesn't make the sheep stronger, smarter, braver, more able to defend itself, more fierce. No, He wants a dependent sheep, not an independent sheep. And so God Himself is the one who leads us. He's already told us in this psalm. He's the one who carries us and tends, for us, tends to us. As the good shepherds, Isaiah forty eleven tells us, He will carry us with His arm and so he's the one that provides the table for us. And he's not bothered by it. He loves us. He's not he loves us and so he's not bothered by it. He's not stressed by it. He's not overworked because he's the limitless, inexhaustible I am. He could let others care for you. He could let other people or other even send his angels to do it. But he himself says, I'm your shepherd. I prefer to do it myself. I mean, have you ever read Daniel 6? That's another one I'm going through. But... Uh, 
and wondered why God didn't let that king save Daniel from the lion's den. I mean, the kings tried all day. Why doesn't God just snap his fingers and say, there you go. It worked for you. The king saved you. Because God didn't want Daniel to say thank you to the king. He wanted Daniel to praise him and say, you know what? You were my shepherd. You kept me in the middle of a ring of lions. And you kept me from breaking bones when I got tossed into a pit at least 20 feet deep. Deep enough to keep lions from jumping out. And he's 84 years old at the time. So if you can imagine, I can imagine at my age being tossed into a 20 foot pit. And coming out without a scratch on me. Let alone having lions around there. And God says, I want to take care of him myself. I'm his shepherd, not you, Darius. And so when you see enemies all around, don't be scared. Don't be afraid to eat. Sit down, relax, and enjoy the meal. Enjoy the provision that God has given to you because he loves you. But he's not just prepared a table. He's prepared medicine. And so uh, this good shepherd that we have, he's not like a doctor today. In fact, maybe I should ask, are there any doctors here before I offend anybody? Okay, no doctors. My church in Taiwan, we're like half doctors. It's like, what in the world? So anyway... um, I'm safe here, so I can say this. But it's not like a doctor today uh, who says, you come to me, you tell me your problem, and I'll tell my nurse to give you some medicine um, from the shelf or something. Or maybe I'll have to order. Or maybe even in Taiwan, you have to take it, you go out, you buy it, you bring it back, and you hand it to him and say, okay, give me this shot or whatever. It's always a, an interesting thing to me. I have to buy it, I have to get it, I have to carry it to you, and then you stab me. That's really fun. But anyhow, he's not like a good shepherd. He, this good shepherd's not like a doctor today. He's got the medicine with him and he administers it himself. He's been carrying it with him for a long time. And so I'm kind of joking. So if there's a doctor online listening, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of, you know, giving flavor. But anyhow, he is, he's carrying this medicine with him because he's prepared. He carries enough to circle all the snake holes. He doesn't know how many snake holes are up there. He carries enough to put on all the sheep's heads and enough to anoint all the cuts and bruises or even where there's... Uh, uh, too many flies around the sheep's eyes and he can anoint that so the flies will stay away. He carries enough. This is the heaviest thing he carries. He has a rod and a staff. That's not so bad. He carries a leather bucket to get the water out. We'll see that in a minute. But he carries all of this oil. Perhaps gallons of oil. How far does he carry it? Well, down the valley, up the hill, and to the top of the mountain. However far he's been going, he's carried that. It's the heaviest thing he's had to carry. And he's not been like, you know, these light through backpackers today. I mean, if you're a through backpacker, it's fine. But, you know, they carry light, light, light. All right? Very light tents, very light sleeping bags, light food, light everything. This is a heavy, big bag of oil that he's got to lug up a mountain side. It's a big deal, and yet he's prepared because he cares for his sheep. He's not like business people today. We have just-in-time inventory, and I kind of say that's just after you need it, not when you need it, right? He doesn't wait until after the fact and say, oh, nuts, I'm going to run down, I'll get some oil, I'll bring it back up. No, he carries it with him. So that when the sheep needs it, he's got it to help with healing, to help keep the dirt out, to help with whatever it is. And so he has prepared medicine. And now uh, we can see that this sheep should be able to trust their shepherd because they know whatever they need, the shepherd has already provided. And that's what Jesus has already said, Matthew 6, 25 to 34. And so in verse 8, he says, don't be like those people who worry about everything because what? Your father knoweth what you have need of before you ask him, right? Before you ask, he already knows. So he's going to provide and so we have this prepared table, prepared medicine, and now prepared water. And uh, maybe you think I shouldn't say prepared water. Maybe you think I should say precious water. But I'm going to say prepared because the shepherd, since he's the good shepherd, the creator shepherd, he can prepare water, right? He can make water come out of rocks. It happens twice in Exodus. As they're leaving Egypt, he created water to begin with. But even human shepherds can dig a a well can find water and even after you find it he has to prepare it he has to get it out of wherever it is on that mountain meadow it might be down in a hole that the sheep would kill itself to get to it and he's got to pull it out with his leather bucket and dump it in what is called a cup and it's kind of it's it's kind of a cup shaped hole they've dug out chiseled out of a rock so he can fill that and each sheep can drink its fill and he lets it go and so he's if he's got 40 to 50 sheep he's going to be drawing water for two hours a day just to give them enough Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to do that. I've not had a well that I had to draw water out of, but I've carried a lot of water in five-gallon buckets when when the pipes froze. 
And I thought my arms were going to fall off before I got just the, I don't remember, 13 or 15 pigs watered. And I was like, man, you guys, you have too much. You need too much water. And that was only 13 or 15, not 40 or 50, and not two hours. And so this shepherd, he finds it, and he pulls it up, and he fills this cup until it overflows because he wants everyone to know that he's the good shepherd who gives even more than what's necessary. He truly prepares the water for the sheep because they can't get it for themselves. He gives them this sweet, cold mountain water. And so this is our prepared God. And yet he's got more that he's prepared for us. He's got a prepared home. And uh, <clears throat> you said 1145. I want to miss it. But anyway... Um, yeah, I know. So now we got a prepared home here in verse 6. And a prepared way to get there. And you could even say, as Charles Spurgeon said, prepared footmen. I use the word or the analogy of, of sheepdogs, but Charles Spurgeon used the analogy of footmen to get us there. These servants that ride on the back of the carriage. Maybe you've seen it uh, with, with uh, some old pictures or something. And he says, these footmen will get you to my home. I've not only got a prepared path, but I've got a prepared footman. And so he starts off and he says, surely. It's a secure uh, future that we have. It's a sure fact that we can trust. And in an age, it's kind of funny. Uh, we live in a postmodern age where no one believes anything about anybody. And, uh, you know, you Google something and you find conflicting evidence all over the place. And yet we still believe Google. But... Um, Still, when we came back on this furlough, Rachel said, you know, everybody in America says absolutely all the time. Even though we don't believe anything is absolutely anything. And so, it's rather funny. But in an age of no absolutes, still God is absolutely reliable. His word is reliable. He's immutable. He never changes and never can change. And so, David sees that and he says, Surely. It's like an exclamation of, of absolute certainty. He says, for sure and for certain, this is true. The world calls this dogmatism, but this is faith. He knows for sure this is true. You know, just to illustrate how much our world avoids trying to say anything is for sure true. When I was in high school, uh, for you young people, that was a long time ago. But uh, for the rest of you, you know, you can remember back to high school. And I had a math teacher. We were doing, like, I think it was pre-calc. The pre-calculus. And so we're going through this problem. We had this homework. We took it home. We couldn't get the right answer because, you know, the right answer is at the back of the book, but you don't get points for getting the right answer. You get points for making like three pages of how you got to the wrong or right answer. And so uh, we all came back in with like six or eight pages. And like, we don't get that answer. We're, we don't know. Are we doing something wrong? He spends the whole math class, or at least half of it, writing it out on the whole huge chalkboard, takes the whole front of the build of the whole front of the classroom. And he gets done and he says, now, that's the right answer, right? And we said, that's not what the book says. That's what we got. And uh, he said, okay. Well, we went back through the whole thing again. And he says, well, I suggest that maybe the book is wrong. I was like, well, that's stupid. If you can't say for sure the book is wrong in a math problem, then you've got a problem. I mean, math is for sure and for certain. You don't have to suggest and you don't have to say maybe. And he couldn't even say that. But David says, for sure and for certain, something will happen. And he's not, you could say he's a fanatic. One person said that a fanatic is just someone that won't change his mind and won't change the subject. And that's what David's doing. But he's not fanatical in the sense of, of being wrong and being bullheaded about it. David wants everyone to know, and God wants all of us to know, that one unalterable fact for the child of God is that God will welcome you into his house. He will shepherd you all the way home. He will lead you there, and he will use goodness and mercy to chase you there. There's nothing you can do to change that if you're truly his child. And there's nothing the world can do to change it. Paul picks up on that in Romans 8, and he says, even uh, death itself, he says, uh, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, certain destruction, nothing can separate us from God's love. If the Father's house is your destination, nothing can keep you from getting there. Nothing at all. And so, not the world, not the flesh, not the devil himself, because God's leading you. His goodness and mercy are chasing you, and you will make it. And so, we come to these two selfless servants that David now talks about. These two good sheepdogs who will give their lives for the sheep. And there's some sheepdogs that are raised with sheep all their lives. They don't hardly know they're not a sheep until the wolf comes, and then they'll fight to the death to defend the sheep. And in fact, we got the privilege of seeing some of them. Um, 
up on the Wyoming range uh, a few weeks ago. We were going camping with dad, Rachel's dad, and we were coming out and we saw these dogs and I said, stop! <laughs> and uh, we got out where you could see these dogs. They're white like the sheep. They look like the sheep, but when the wolf comes, they're not a sheep. All right, and they're these dogs that just protect the sheep. And they're there all the time. And these good dogs, they not only protect, but they guide the sheep. And the shepherd can, can guide them with whistles and calls. I don't know if you've ever been able to see like a program where they train these dogs and they use them to get sheep into these diff- different uh, enclosures or over bridges or difficult things. And the shepherd can't do anything. All he does is whistle. Kind of makes me envious. I grew up with cows and I had to do most of the chasing myself. And I learned to make the cows come to me by calling them because... You know, cows, they're, they're, they're big and they're kind of ugly and lumbering looking. But when they get mad, they can run anywhere they, that you want faster than you can. And so it's better to get them to come. But sheep don't do that all the time. And so they use dogs to get them to go to where they want them. I mean, you have Jesus saying, my sheep hear my voice and they come. There is that. But when they're in danger, they just run like mad. And they don't know where they're going and they're going to do the wrong thing. So the dog can ch- uh, sh- chase them and make them go the right way to get them away from the cliff, to get them away from danger. And so God has these two, what I'm going to call sheepdogs, herding you into heaven. And you might think that sheepdogs are mean and they hate the sheep, but that's why I started with saying some of them don't even seem to know that they're dogs until they have to be obeying the shepherd and and protecting the sheep or, or helping the sheep go where they need to go. These dogs are laying around. In fact, when the dogs we saw with the sheep, they're just laying around. The sheep are all around them and one sheep's laying on one side of them and another's behind them and they're, they're all buds. They love the sheep. And I say that to to emphasize again what I said in Sunday school. So many people think that God is a God of wrath and anger. And he comes along with this rod that we saw here in verse 4. And he's just bashing the sheep wherever he can. And oh, you took a misstep and hitting them over the head. And he's not like that. When he chases, he chases with goodness and mercy. Not with anger and wrath. He might have to punish. But he does that. Generally with mercy. I mean, that's what uh, our hope is. That mercy that's new every morning. And so I've been saying chase and not follow a lot. So I think I want to just take a moment now and look at this word follow. Because as we understand this word, it is not the idea of follow. I mean, uh, if I follow you, I can follow you casually. I can follow you really from a distance. I don't have to follow you close. I don't have to imitate everything you do. I could follow you to a store. and I could, As long as I can barely see you, I can follow you. Or maybe you've given me directions and I kind of follow the way that you went, but I'm not pursuing you with intensity. I'm not close to you. But that's not this word. This word is uh, used 134 times in the Old Testament. And it's used generally and translated with, uh, by the word pursue. And so to give you a flavor of how it's used in the Old Testament, Genesis 14, verses 14 and 15, Abraham pursued the people that took Lot captive. He didn't follow them and say, you know what? Those guys look kind of like they're interesting. I'll kind of follow them, make sure they don't hurt Lot too much. I don't mind if they, you know, they torture him a little bit. No, he pursued them to attack them to bring Lot back safely. You have Pharaoh He pursued Israel to kill them at the Red Sea. He didn't follow casually along. He's coming along to kill them. All right. It's an intense and an earnest pursuit. Um, In David's life, as he's looking back, he could say, and from 1 Samuel 23 to 26, Saul pursued David. It wasn't to give him a hug and say, hey, you know what? I haven't seen you in a long time. You're my son-in-law. I'll give you a big... No, he was pursuing him to kill him. And all I say, uh, all I'm doing to say that is, all I'm trying to say with that, if I can ever get my words around in English, it'll be great. Uh, But anyhow, what I'm trying to say with all that is, a lot of times we pursue things in hate with a lot more energy and a lot more diligence and a lot more intensity than we pursue things in love, right? And our love will give up much sooner than our anger will, correct? I mean, if you watch and you could look at world history, you could look at anything and love gives up much sooner than hate or anger or vengeance, correct? That's a human sin. That's not true. That's not God's love. It's not Christ-like love, but I'm just saying it's true, and so David, when he is looking, I said 134, I, I was dyslexic, because 143 times. Uh, anyhow, he says, 
goodness and mercy are pursuing you with an intensity that really can only be described in negative ways for when an enemy is chasing you or you're chasing an enemy. And it's that relentless, that earnest, that intense, and it will not stop until one of the two of you are dead, in this case us, when we're in heaven, right? But it's not anger that's doing it for God. It's a love. This word mercy is his hesed, kesed love, his steadfast, loyal love, and his goodness. And so let's look at these two dogs just for a minute that are pursuing us to the death or hounding us to death, if I can say that. One's goodness. How God's goodness to us, his grace in our lives, and, and how he has blessed us over and over again. In fact, Psalm David tells, or not David, I don't think actually, but anyhow, Psalm 66 or 68 says that he loads us with benefits. He gives us to us over and over and over again because he's a good God. And so we, we have this goodness of God that's pursuing us to our death. But the problem is sometimes we start to expect it. And when we don't get all the goodness that we wanted... We start to get angry, don't we? And we start to fuss and fume and fret, as David says we shouldn't in Psalm 37. And so maybe to kind of balance that, David says, you know what? There's another dog, and that's mercy. So that when you are not getting all the good things that you want, you can turn around and say, wow, there's mercy. There's all the bad things I'm not getting that I should have. And so these two dogs, they balance each other. They help us remember that God... We deserve God's wrath, but we're getting His grace and His love and His mercy because He is that kind of God. It reminds us that when things are bad, God has given us much more than we deserve. He's giving us heaven, so we shouldn't complain because we will make it to heaven. This is the love that Paul says we can't be separated from because you'll never shake off this pursuer. You'll never outrun him. He will chase you down and hunt you down until you die, and he'll make sure you get to the Father's house. There are some troubles you might outrun, but you'll never outrun goodness and mercy. It will run you down and will hound you to death and it will take you straight to heaven. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are absent from the body and present with the Lord. And one pastor picked up on that and said, before the Christian even knows he's dead, he's in heaven. And, you know, I love one song and it's, I'm not going to sing it for you, but you might know the words, but just think of stepping on shore and finding a heaven, of touching a hand and finding it God's, of breathing new air and finding it celestial, of waking up in glory and finding it home and finding it, it's the Father's house, your Father's house, the one who loved you and who shepherded you all the way home where you can fit in. And goodness and mercy are the ones that will get you there. They'll shepherd you. They'll pursue you all the days of their life. They won't get tired and quit. They won't get angry and quit. They won't get disgusted and quit. They won't stop and chase a rabbit. They won't forget about you at supper time. I mean, I have had some dogs that when food was around, they forgot all else. These two don't. They will pursue you every day, all day, until they've chaperoned you safely home. Rain or shine, war or peace, sickness or health, these dogs will not leave you. I've had some really good dogs in my life. I've had some really lousy dogs in my life. The really good ones never leave you. You are in a mess and they don't leave you. A couple times I wish they would when the cows were getting mad at the dogs and the dogs were coming close to me. I was like, hey, go away. But, uh, you know, they would stay with you in trouble. One of them, I was being attacked and then my sister was being attacked by a, uh, a, a, what's it called? A group of dogs in Chinese, I know. A group of dogs, uh, not a herd of dogs. Anyway, a bunch of wild dogs, whatever those, the group is called. Pack. Man, my English is terrible because of of Chinese. Nate says it pollutes my brain. But anyhow, um, I was being attacked by this group of dogs, pack of dogs. And my dog stood between me and all of them and fought them long enough for me to get a shovel to go back and help him. All right, so that we could both get out of it alive. He stuck with me. The dog after him, uh, he'd have been home. I'd have been eaten for sure. Uh, That dog was no good. But that first dog, he was a good dog. He wouldn't leave. And these two will never leave you. They don't cut and run. If you don't heed the rod and the staff, these dogs will run you down. They might bite a little bit. They might snap and snarl a little bit to get you in the right way, to herd you back to safety. They might growl, but it's not because they hate you. It's because they love you and they want what's good for you and they want to get you to the Father's house. So listen to them and obey them and know it's an absolute fact that they're seeing you home. 
There's a Shakespeare play about a warrior who's so strong and amazing he can fight off an army. And one night there's this guy, he wants to go home, but he can't. And that warrior stands up and says, I'm taking you home tonight. You'll make it home safely. And that's what these dogs do. They will get you home. They will pursue you all the days of your life and they will get you to the father's house. So that leads us from two servants to a secure future. And that future is the father's house. I already said you're loved by the father's heart. You're led by the father's hand and now you're welcome in the father's house. And in fact, if you're a Christian, you're expected there. You will make it. Your presence is required if you're a Christian. You have to be there. You can't be absent. You can't miss it because the Father has provided for you, led you, been with you, protected you, sustained you, and chased you home. But when you get there, you're going to get to dwell there. You're going to get comfortable. You're going to get used to it. Settle in and feel like it's your home. You know, hotels are nice, and we've lived in a lot of them at different times, but they're not home, right? You get to the hotel, you can lay down, you can go to sleep, but it's not home. In fact, when we were back uh, several, a couple months ago, we got sick. And that first, uh, it was on a Sunday night, we got sick. And it's not nice being sick anywhere, but it's really not nice in a hotel. All right? It's just really inconvenient. And you just want to be home where you can just relax and be miserable all by yourself or on your own or whatever. And not around strangers and have to walk out and drive home. But that's the difference. We're going to dwell and get used to and get comfortable in the father's house. And so maybe I can illustrate it this way. When Rachel and I were first married, we stayed at mom and dad's house in Rock Springs, Wyoming, different times. Rachel dwelled there, but I didn't. I just kind of lived there. I, I existed there. When we were on deputation, we stayed with him for a while. When we are out west here, and eventually I got to the point where I dwell in their house. But man, for a long time, I was really uncomfortable. I mean, if I had to if I had to use a vehicle and like, or maybe Rachel was gone to town, I was really hesitant to say to dad or mom, hey, can I use your keys? Uh, I was really hesitant if I didn't have a warm enough coat to say, hey, can I use a coat? I don't even ask anymore. I just go up, grab a coat, put it on, go do what I want to do, come back. I dwell there. If I'm hungry, I do what I didn't do when we were first married. I just go open the fridge and look till I find something. I didn't used to do that. I was like, oh, I'm hungry. I'm going to wait till Rachel's home. I mean, drink more water so you're not hungry, right? Because I didn't dwell. I wasn't comfortable. It wasn't that dad and mom didn't love me or I didn't love them, but I wasn't comfortable. But we're going to get to dwell in the Father's house forever. We're going to be forever comfortable. We're going to be in the place where Psalm 1611 says, At his right hand there are pleasures forevermore, and you're welcome to enjoy them. You can go out. I'm, I, now at dad and mom's house, I can go out and ride the four-wheeler. I can do whatever I want. But in God's house, I can enjoy all those pleasures that are forevermore, forever. They're mine to enjoy. I dwell there. It's mine, partly, because I'm the Father's, and it's the Father's house. And only what's holy and good can be there, according to Revelation 20 to 22. Those who have been blood-bought by the Lamb. If you're His child, that includes you. And you can know that you have an eternity in God's house if you want to. It's certain if you've trusted Christ for salvation that you will be there to enjoy those pleasures forevermore. It's certain if you've placed your trust in Christ alone for salvation. Not works, but Christ alone. Christ's work on the cross. And so, the question would simply be, who will trust Christ by faith and confess Him with their mouth and go with the rest of us who are Christians on that road to heaven? Who is willing to say, I would like to live in that house forever? And so the prepared path. As we look at this, this is really by way of application. I already said one of them, if you're here and you don't know Christ, we would invite you and you wouldn't have to talk to me. I know I'm strange and I'm weird and I, I can't even speak very well in English anymore. But, you know, you could talk to anyone here that you know, that you trust, that would, be lo that would love to share with you how you can know that you are on your way to heaven, how to trust Christ alone for salvation. And I'd like to give you this to help you maybe think more clearly on that point. Because maybe you say, I've been to church, I know a lot of verses, I know a lot of good things that I should do, I do a lot of good things. I know Psalm 23, I knew it before you ever preached it. And so, maybe this story would help you. There was a famous British uh, actor who had just performed some different plays, and he was just in front of an audience so that uh, they could uh, ask him some questions. And they were asking him different questions, and this old pastor stood up, and in his broken voice, he, was, uh, he couldn't speak very well anymore. 
he said, I'd just like to hear you in your perfect accents uh, quote Psalm 23 for all of us. And that actor said back to him, I will do that on one condition. If you'll speak, if you'll quote Psalm 23 after I do. The pastor said, no problem, I'd be happy to do that. And so that British actor in his perfect accent uh, stood up and he quoted Psalm 23 and everyone clapped, everyone applauded and said that was a great job. And then the pastor stood up and he in his cracked voice, not very good accent anymore, he quoted Psalm 23. And when he got done, there was dead silence. And the actor noted that difference and he jumped to his feet and said, see, that's the difference. See, I know Psalm 23, but that man knows the shepherd. And it would be terrible today if you knew Psalm 23, but you didn't know the shepherd personally. So you yourself could say, the Lord is my shepherd. He's mine. I'm his. And so as we look at that, I just want to ask you, do you know the shepherd yourself? And for all of us who are Christians, will you trust the shepherd with the fears and troubles of life? Because for sure there's fears and troubles. We are sheep. He's told us that very plainly. Psalm 100, Isaiah 53. We know we're sheep. We're surrounded by enemies. We're surrounded, but we have our own flesh to deal with. It constantly leads us astray. Will you trust the shepherd with the fears and troubles of life? You will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's not just your death. That includes near-death experiences. That includes uh, perhaps the, the, the death of loved ones. As you've walked through that valley with them, They've come through on the other side in heaven and you've stayed here and you've gone through that difficult process. Will you trust him through that? Will you eat with your enemies all around you? Will you just sit down and relax and say, there's a lot of trouble, but my shepherd has it all planned out and I can just relax and I can let him be God and me be me and I'll just go with him through life. You don't have to fear because God is the one with you making sure you don't lack and since he's got your eternal future in mind, he can, you can trust him with right now. You can trust him with your troubles of today and tomorrow. I have this question for you. Will you heed the snaps and snarls of goodness and mercy? Because we have to admit, sometimes goodness and mercy snaps and snarls, right? Sometimes we are going so far, so wrong, uh, in the wrong direction, that it will snap and snarl, maybe even nip at our heels to get us to turn around. Will you listen? Because so many of us get entrenched and say, I'm going to do this anyway. Or we say, you know what? I am positive that this is what I want to do. It can't be that bad. Will you listen? I mean, that snap and snarl might be a brother or sister in Christ saying, hey, I'm concerned about you. Why are you doing this? Why haven't you been in church? Why have you said this, done this, posted this on Facebook? Don't say, well, it's my Facebook. I can do what I want. You put it out there, it's for everyone else to see. They can ask. It might be difficult, but heed the snaps and snarls of mercy. Don't resist them. Trust them like friends. And so, as we look at this psalm, I want just to note that this shepherd offers security in life, or sufficiency in life and security in death. Will you take his offer and walk with him hand in hand, trusting him to provide for you each day? walk with you all the way, and to shepherd you all the way into heaven?